Okay, starting from the top row, um, this first row of modules are all 1U format. Um, so they are saving space uh, from a standard module uh, size and putting those functions into this 1U one, one row up here. So you kind of get like a, uh, a 9 U's worth of functionality into something that's 7U. Um, so first of all is this micro MIDI MIDI interface by Intelligel, and it provides you know about seventy five percent of the functions that I would use if I were generating my control voltages the way I've been doing it for the past decade, which is by using an audio interface and crafting those um, with tools on the computer. Um, there. Are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Um, if you're generating all your control voltages with a DC coupled audio interface, then uh, everything's sample accurate. Um, you don't have any issues with the synchronization of issues between channels. Um, you have complete flexibility because everyone, every, every signal is audio rate. And you don't have to worry about some signals being uh, you know, control rate or lower resolution, or you have polling issues or that type of thing. Um, the advantage of having a MIDI interface is that uh, it's smaller, cheaper, you don't have to carry around an audio interface, you don't have to worry about calibrating the outputs. Um, everything's labeled, which is really super nice. Um, these LEDs that are on top of some of these outputs are uh, extremely helpful to figuring out and debugging your system. Sometimes modular can be perplexing, especially in a live situation. Um, so. Um, I do appreciate the fact that I can just plug in a USB inter USB cable and I've connected my modular to my computer and it responds just like a normal typical MIDI device. Uh, next up over here is this uh, zero scope. Um, I think that a scope is extremely important to have on a modular. And that's because without a scope, uh, you are really only kind of guessing or just using your ears and maybe not totally understanding what your signal is doing and being able to visualize signals is very important. That said, um, I think that I would prefer to use an O-Tool like I have in the labs at school um, for two reasons. One, uh, this is very small. It has to be small to fit into the 1U format, but uh, I can't read that even on the best of days. I'm 50 and I can't you know, uh, read that very small type. Um, the other reason is that this product violates a user interface convention that bothers me a lot, and that is the same physical UI, meaning this encoder, is used for both navigation and data entry, and that drives me up the wall, and I typically do not get along well with products that violate that. So um, I think at some point I might swap this out, but I think it's important that you have a scope, and right now this is better than nothing. Uh, next up is a multifunction module, which uh, gives me uh, the functions of something that generates pulses, uh, sample and hold, uh, smoothing with a slew generator, um, uh, a noise source, we have pink and white noise, and they're all normaled into each other the way that you probably find pretty useful. So uh, in addition to being a 1U module, it packs a lot of functions into one space. This is a total win as far as a module. I use this constantly. I find, and because it's so flexible, I find lots of different ways to, to use it quite a bit. Um, so uh, this, was, this is great. I love, I love this uh, 1U module. Next up is um, this quad attenuator. And this has a, a lot of useful functions in addition to it being an attenuator. Like this is just an attenuator, basically. Um, there's some other, other tricks up its sleeve. So let's, uh, let's just demonstrate uh, a couple of these functions really quickly. First of all, uh, let's just see if we have signal here. Okay, so that's a, oscill that's a sine wave from the VCO6. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to trigger like one of the triggered drum sounds on on the braids here. So let's find yeah, your drum should be fine. Okay, so uh, I'll use the trigger input and um, here's the the clock output and this is the sixteenth output and the clock output on the on the micro MIDI has a clock divide output. So if I want um, faster clicks, like this is pretty much like the 16th note. Um, 
I can use this clock divide output and slow it down by dividing it down so it's not quite... Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so I have this situation where maybe I want to change the, the pitch of this drum. So this is a situation where I might use like a sample and hold. So I'll take this uh, hold output, which is already patched into the random source that is built into the module. Okay, you can tell that uh, it's moving a little bit too rapidly. So what I want to do is I want to take the same signal uh, that's generating the trigger and use that to trigger the sample and hold. Uh, so we'll just patch this into a molt. One side of the molt goes to the trigger input like we had it before. And another one is going to fire off the sampling process. So I'll bring this into the trigger input. So now each note gets its own pitch. Um, but I don't like the, the variety of, of timbre here, so or the, the variety of modulation. So I want to attenuate uh, the output. So I will plug this into this attenuator. Uh, here's the output, plug this into the input of the attenuator. Now when I move this knob, we should get a, a, a wider variety of pitch variation. But um, let's say I don't have this coarse bias control on the module itself. A lot of situations, uh, you might want to shift the bias by yourself. So um, that's built into this module. So instead of using this first output from the attenuator, it's going to feed into this B section, and then this I can use as a bias control. So that's with no modulation. Here, let's subdivide this differently. Now I can shift it up or down. So anyway, that demonstrates some of the usefulness of uh, these two modules in addition to the, the clock dividing on uh, the MicroMIDI. Okay, next up is this section, uh, which is my oscillators. And there's four modules in particular, uh, the VCO6, the VCO2RM, uh, the braids, and the E350. Um, so the, the VCO6 is my analog oscillator that allows me to do linear FM. Uh, there's another analog oscillator, the VCO2RM. Uh, it's a dual oscillator in a combination that we found pretty useful in history, starting with like the you know the Buchla 289s. It's not as flexible as a Buchla 289, but I feel like there's a lot of uh, it's informed by the S1 Mark II uh, in some of its timbre generating. Um, I don't know uh, the way you know this, the 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 way the design is influenced, um, and there's three factors here. Uh, one is the, the Expo FM that is available from Oscillator One, to Oscillator Two. Uh, the availability of a ring modulator, which is four quadrant multiply. You can actually even use this as a four, four quadrant VCA if you want, because the the inputs are patchable. And then also the sync function, and it's the combination of the ring modulator and the frequency modulation and the sync that unlocks a huge variety of tone. Uh, so to demonstrate this, I can just like bring these into both their sine wave positions, and I've got the FM amount turned down. And I have sync off. So I'm going to use the the ring modulator, and that's going to give me my typical you know ring modulation tones. I should be able to get also. Um, some tremolo at control rates, um, but I'm interested in the timbre generation. So first of all, uh, I can take the this attenuator and that routes the output from oscillator one to the frequency modulation input on oscillator two. And then I can couple that with the sync. Like 
universe of tones just from one oscillator. Uh, of course, it doesn't have um, like the the wave shaper that a Buchla oscillator would have, but it's a great analog oscillator, and I'm going to use it as the, uh, the FM modulation source for the oscillator that does linear FM. There's no linear FM on the VCO2RM, and I do like to have that option on my modular. Uh, so there is a linear FM input on the VCO6, so that means that this has to be the carrier. Uh, so I'll have the sine wave output here, and I will first do some uh, frequency modulation with an expo input. Okay, so, and that's great. It gives you a, a nice wide variety of FM tones, but um, what I want to demonstrate is uh, what I want to demonstrate is the ability to um, amplitude modulate the modulator to the carrier without producing the characteristic bending that you get from Expo FM. So this output is going to get modulated. So that goes into the input of a VCA. The VCA is going to get modulated by, I guess, this thing's already going. So I'll use this um, uh, envelope generator. And then the output of this is going to modulate my carrier which is going to go into, we'll start with um, the FM3 input, which is the Expo input. All right, let's find uh, the sine wave output. And let's see. OK, so here we hear some of that characteristic bending. And the reason this is important is um, the reason this is important is uh, sometimes you want to have the have the timbre change of frequency modulation without this associated bending. You're not using it strictly as timbral. You're just you know you're actually worried about notes. Um, so compare. Um, that to this FM1 input. Which is just a timbral change. Um, so when you think about frequency modulation, being able to amplitude modulate the, the modulator via velocity, for example, so higher velocities produce uh, you know, brighter timbres, or you know, when you think of an operator, an operator has a, a VCA and an envelope generator that's part of the definition of what an operator is. So if you want to do linear FM, it means that you're amplitude modulating the, the output of the modulator, uh, and so you need uh, something that has linear FM. So uh, the VCO6 is what I use for that. Uh, there's a couple digital modules. I have the E350, which uh, gives me a real wide variety of digital timbre. Um, of course, I can modulate this with, a, with any type of voltage I want. Um, there's also, if I use the XY output, you can get 2D modulation. You can move along the wavetable on two axes. Um, that's great if I have a surplus of modulation sources. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, any of these modules can function as an LFO. I tend to use the VCO6 as an LFO a lot, which is quite a waste. Um, but, you know, um, I do what I do. And um, the E350, the, the C bank, has some nice uh, LFO shapes that if you drive them at very, very low rates, um, you can get some really interesting, wonderfully evolving moving textures. Uh, the Braids uh, is an extremely popular module. You'll notice that most of my modules are not very new. Um, the Braids is one of the more recent modules I got, and it's discontinued. Um, one of the things I like about the Braids is that it allows me to decouple my composition of control voltages from uh, the composition of the modulation that's driving it. So in other words, I've composed my notes, and my notes are going into the, the you know the one volt per octave input of the device, and then I can record many different takes by using the same modulation I've composed and plugging them into the, the, the timbre and color inputs of this. So uh, let's find you know, something obvious. And then I plug that in. 
So uh, I can send my node information into the braids, I can change the model to something else, keep my modulation sources the same, and come up with several different variations where the timbre is radically different, but the movement of the modulation uh, matches previous takes, and then I can edit between them. Uh, but uh, overall, it's a, it's a great sounding module that gives you a lot of uh, spectral options in a very, very small space. Um, so um, that does it with this section. This ATT4 I dropped in because uh, I was working on a project where I needed a little bit more attenuation, but this module typically lives in a separate case. Um, I don't really care about blank spaces in my modular. There is a, the danger of like dropping a, a cable into a, a particular open hole. But as I said, I, I've got more modules than I have case space, and I'm not worried about like, oh, there's a blank space in my modular, and I find this offensive, and I need to buy something other than a blank face panel to um, to put in there. What do you guys think? Uh, no, I don't do that. Uh, I just I put in the modules that I need for the task that I'm you know doing, and this particular configuration has been consistent and uh, uh, for you know about six months or, or so I might you know swap out a modular or two here or there but um, empty spaces don't bother me uh, next up are my filters so uh, again I want variety and I've got three different varieties of filters uh, the middle one is like your standard uh, low pass uh, filter. So if I if I need something that's that sounds very low passy and vintage, um, I can I can use this E440 module. It gives me that vintage tone. It's you know somewhat like um, somewhat like the Rev Two Profit from Profit Five, but it's like this is your Platonic ideal low pass filter. Um, it tracks beautifully. Uh, you can use it as a sine wave oscillator in a in a pinch because it tracks so well. Just you know crank the the resonance up, and now you have uh, uh, a really. Uh, quite a pure sine wave to to work with. It's actually purer than a lot of the the triangle core oscillators that I've used in the past. Uh, next up is the MMG, and this is a low pass gate. Uh, it's the thing that gives me if I'm searching for like a West Coasty Buchla esque timbre, I'm going to go that that route. So um, if I feed this with something that's very FME, like you would get with a, a Buchla 289. Um, Let's see, we want some, uh, just like some random FME type stuff. And then we're going to strike, we're going to use this strike input. And strike inputs work best uh, if you are, if you use like a trigger signal, something that's stateless and very, 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 very quick. So let's uh, fire up our MIDI device here, get some trigger signals going, and use the strike input. Uh, input and this is the output. That's kind of weird, not hearing anything. That's working, but this is not. There we go. Okay. Trigger. Helps if you turn the volume up. Let's add some FM modulation. Uh, pitch up it. So very, very plucky, um, like low pass gate. You, it, a lot of times you don't need to actually follow this up with a VCA. Um, sometimes you do, especially if you bring the, the frequency up, but it gives me that characteristic kind of uh, plucky bukla sound that I like a lot. Um, and then finally, the MMS, MMF6 um, covers like everything that isn't a low pass filter or low pass gate. 
so that means I'm using this typically for like high pass modes and band pass modes. Um, if I'm you know combining in series with another filter. And then um, the reason I, I have an MMF1 that I like a lot and I find it easier to use than the MMF6. This is a little, it's designed for a broader use, uh, a broader range of use cases. And so it can be, a, you know, a little bit, not as easy to dial dial this in. But one of the thing, the reason why this is, is in my case and the MMF1 is not is because of the saturation outputs. Um, I'll demonstrate that a little bit later when we talk about some of these other modules. Um, so those are that's what I use for my three filters. Um, these are all the VCAs that I have in here. I can probably use another two. I think uh, I would be happiest if I had another VCA 4MX. I it's <laughs> it's really a, a, an amazing module. It's very simple. Uh, the dynamic range is incredible. I uh, like sometimes when I'm using this, I use it. I start off using it like a mixer where. I'm taking the output of like uh, multiple oscillators and summing them together, uh, and then so I'd be like, So now uh, let's change some of these waveforms to something else. And then once I've like used this as a mixer, then I find myself like starting to add control voltages to it through uh, my control voltage sources. So I'll just uh, like quickly compose something. Uh, and then I need some other source to drive this. And Are not in sync with each other. Maybe what I should do is uh, get these get these pings lined up. Actually, now I'm I'm pretty much not talking about VCAs at this point. I'm talking more about uh, these envelope generators. Um, but let's let's just go ahead and do this. It's, it's a mixer, it's a bunch of VCAs, it's extremely flexible, I love the VCA 4MX. Next to it is the VCA 2P. Uh, this gives me another channel, another two channels of VCAs, but also uh, panning if I want to use a mono input to a stereo output. I have VCA controlled panning there. Um, you were just hearing me mess with the pingable envelope generator. This is one of three two-channel envelope generators that I have. The maths and the pingball envelope generator can function as LFOs. They have cycle modes. The ADSR2 uh, VC2 is strictly a standard um, a ADSR that has to be triggered. Um, the reason I like this is because I have got VC control over the, the segments, so attack to case sustain release. Um, it has an inverted output. Um, you can adjust the, the level of the output of the VCA with, or the envelope generator with CV, and that's super useful. I like the fact that um, I can take this gate output and it can normal into both sides of it. Uh, I don't have to use these uh, stackable cables to, to do that. I think that's a, another example of like Schwayman, you know, thinking through the use cases. Um, so again, like three different ki kinds of filters, three different kinds of envelope generators that I find particularly useful. Um, the maths is of course more than an envelope generator or uh, LFO. Um, the maths, um, 
you can tell mine's pretty old. Uh, it is an extremely useful module. It's multifunction, like like these modules. Um, one of the things I like about the maths are these are these expo. Uh, are, I'm sorry, the the response of the envelope generators. So uh, I find myself using a lot like with kick drums. So if we take this clock output. Love this um, subdivide control on on the clock output. Um, that makes it makes the micro MIDI even more useful. So this is now firing off this uh, envelope generator, and I'll use one side to modulate the the frequency of uh, this oscillator, and then I'll use the other side to modulate the VCA. So this is the control voltage input on the VCA. Um, I need my monitor output somewhere. Lost my cable again. All right, and then um, I need to feed the input from the VCA uh, from the oscillator. I'll use the triangle output. Uh, probably want to turn this up, probably turn this down. Um, now it's going to be all about kind of adjusting the math. So that's a lot of modulation. Um, already I'm getting kind of a good tone. Uh, the the fall control is going to control how much knock on my kick drum. Um, and this is where having the expo control really makes a difference. I'd have to kind of dial this down. I don't really like the action down here for linear log response, but when I go to expo, that sounds really nice. I want a fast attack. Um, this is the VCA side, so like how long of the decay of my kick drum is going to be controlled by this fall control. Again, expo response can be really helpful. This is one of those situations where uh, when I'm making kick drums, uh, it's helpful to, to dirty up the output. Sometimes I use a saturator software wise, but if I have this module available, um, I can just use like the low pass output, um, turning the cutoff frequency all the way up so it's essentially not filtering anything. There's no resonance at all either. Um, and then I've got two clipping options. So uh, this is the soft clip option. So uh, let's plug in the output of our VCA. And again, this is the clean output. This is the dirty. And now I'm going to use the hard clip. So I find that I need a lot less um, full time to get the knock. But um, if I want to dirty up, if I want to saturate my signals, um, that's one reason I use the, the MMF6. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is kind of the the, the companion module to the, the micro MIDI. First of all, there's this buffered mult uh, that's going to allow me to take the pitch output of the micro MIDI and drive multiple oscillators without sag. Uh, if I want to drive all the oscillators, and I do that all the time, it's helpful to have the, the buff in there. Um, a normal multiple, a passive multiple, which I have in my modular as well. Um, uh, sometimes isn't good enough for control signals. I think you need one for your pitch output. It doesn't really matter as much for gate signals. So uh, passive molts are useful and active molts should be dedicated for your pitch output. Depending on how many voices of pitch output you have, you're gonna determine how many buffered molts you want. Um, but uh, for control signals that I want to generate and uh, aren't covered by the micro MIDI, that's what the crow is for. Um, this module I use to cover the gaps of what I can't do with the micro MIDI and what I used to do by generating my own uh, control voltages with a with a um, DC coupled audio interface, um, the Crow allows me to create a Max for Live device or use Max and any message I can create in Max I can send out the Crow. There are some limitations. It's not um, the bandwidth isn't like a audio interface where you have full audio bandwidth of like the inputs and outputs to and from the computer. So uh, if I try to, for example, 
create envelopes with the crow and have that have the micro midi generate pitches i may have some discrepancies between the note onsets uh the the inputs need to be pulled uh at certain intervals so it's that's not audio rate but you know 95 percent of the functionality that i would get with the dc coupled audio interface i've got the crow and it's it's very small it's in my modular it doesn't require more power another you know like adapter to carry around or whatever um so um i am finding it very useful and it's very compact uh, so to demonstrate what the what i can do with the crow um, so say for example, I have a, a number on max that I want to send out to my modular. That's pretty easy. Um, this is the first output of the crow. I'm going to plug that into the scope, but probably because you can't see the scope, I'm also going to bring this into the CV input of this oscillator so we can hear it. Um, now I should, what that should allow me to do is I can come over to my computer and yeah, wow, that's... Uh, if I can generate a number, uh, I can send it to my modular with... Oh, I, I destroyed the crow by um, uh, sending it out of range values or changing the values too quickly. So this is something that I find annoying about the crow. So I'm going to need to like wake it up again. So it's happy again. Um, the other thing that I've set up, uh, I want to demonstrate the input. So I built a, a quantizer, um, which was pretty easy to do. I just took the beep quantizer and uh, plugged it into the output of um, what I receive on this input. Um, so I'm going to create, I'm just going to take white noise, plug that into the input, and then I'm going to send this output to be a control voltage, one volt per octave source for the oscillator. And um, it's being triggered um, in sync with my project, so 16th notes or whatever. Um, and I'm also generating a trigger signal on another on another channel, so I can take this output from the crow and have it fire off this envelope generator. Perfect. So then now we can uh, use an use a VCA. Still not processed yet with the envelope generator. There we go. That demonstrates like some of the real pluckiness that you can get with the ADSR VC2. I like it a lot. Okay, so uh, with this quantizer, um, so that's root and fifth. And so on. Um, but um, I have a lot of flexibility with this module, um, and it's extremely useful. So uh, it's earned a space in my in my case.